Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day you've given to us, for the opportunity to gather together in your house. As we look to your word, we pray, Father, that you would open our minds and hearts to be receptive to what you have for each and every one of us. We're so thankful, Father, that through your word and from your word, you're able to speak to each individual heart. And so we give you the praise and the glory for whatever comes forth from this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I begin my final message here this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Now, as we've been going through 1 Peter, uh, we have seen the theme of suffering over and over again. And that is one of the primary themes in this epistle. So I'm reading 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. And if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator." The phrase fiery trial is a single word, the word purosis. Now, literally, it means fire or burning. Uh, It's used figuratively for a fiery trial or test, a calamity, or some intense suffering. And herein we see a significant change in intensity regarding the sufferings of which Peter has already spoken so often. He is now speaking of a significantly more severe trial than they have previously known. Now, herein, many commentators hold that Peter is speaking specifically of the persecutions that would come from Rome. This would begin with the burning of Rome by Nero in AD 64, which he then attributed to the Christians, calling them a seditious cult. Much of the city was destroyed. Many citizens in Rome lost most or all of their possessions, which in turn created great bitterness toward any Christian. Peter's already spoken of the suffering of Christians simply because they were pilgrims or sojourners, the outsiders, whose lifestyle and faith clearly set them apart. But once Rome was burned, its citizens saw Christians not merely as different, but dangerous. Many believe that 1 Peter was written immediately before the burning of Rome, in light of the fact that Peter does not mention Nero or the fire. Others hold that it was written at the time that Rome was burned, and so there's no need to mention something that everyone was quite aware of and would only inflame Rome even more. In either case, it's certain that the intensity of the persecution was significantly greater than any experienced before because now persecuting Christians had become a public policy. The law of the land was now against every Christian. And I see a certain irony here in that we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing 
happen to you. Now, strange and strange. Two occurrences in the same word. The first one, zenitso, is a verb. The second, xenos, is a noun. They're in the same sentence. The first one is translated, think it's strange. Second is translated, some strange thing. And the root idea essentially is to be astonished by the strangeness of something. A contemporary description would basically be, don't stand around with your mouth hanging open. The one incident I can think of that would be comparable to this is when Christ ascended and the disciples stood there watching him. And the angel said, why are you standing here watching? You have something to do. Get moving. To be so overwhelmed by something that you see that you're essentially motionless. Now, Peter writes that this file, fiery trial is coming to try you, which means to test you. It's the Greek word perosmos. And it means to try or to test something to learn the nature or character of it by submitting it through extensive testing, and typically in the New Testament, that testing was done by fire. Uh, in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, he said, Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to tre- test you as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, these two thoughts are tied together. Rather than being amazed by the intensity of the persecution that you are experiencing, we are to rejoice to the extent or the degree or the depth of that suffering, knowing that we partake or share in the sufferings of Christ. The greater the suffering, the greater we share in his glory. Compare that to Paul's words, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18. Paul writes, Therefore, do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, notice that, our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We're called to adopt an eternal perspective. That takes the fiery trial, which is more intense than anything we've known, and transforms it into that light affliction, which is but for a moment. The fiery trial in this word is tied directly to the principle of sharing in Christ's sufferings, and through sharing in his sufferings, sharing in his glory. That's why Peter writes, to the extent, some a little suffering, some great suffering. To the degree to which you suffer, to that degree you share in Christ's glory. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 15. Paul speaks very specifically of testing our works for our rewards. He writes in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, No other foundation can any lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. This passage is only for believers. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If, conditional, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so is by fire. You have a description through simple objects 
of what the testing process is about. Gold and silver are refined by the, by the fire. The dross is burned off. Only the pure remains. But the wood and the hay and the stubble are completely consumed. There's nothing left at all. Now, some individuals have taken that to mean you can lose your salvation. But that's not what Paul's talking about. He is talking about our works for Christ. Those that are worthy of Christ are refined and purified, and for those we will be rewarded. The things that we have done that are not worthy of Christ will completely be consumed and there'll be no reward. This light affliction is the strange trial that Paul and Peter talk about. They're one and the same. More than that, these trials and the sufferings associated with them are counted among the believer's works to be judged on the day of the Bema Seat of Christ. Now, we tend to look at the works that we perform. We think in terms of, uh, did I give a tithe or did I teach a Sunday school class? Did I do good things? Did I help others? Whatever. But God counts the suffering that we endure, along with those overt works that we have chosen to do. And so they, too, are tested by fire to prove whether or not they're worthy of reward. And that is the basis of the rewards that we will receive from Christ. Another contrast is found in 1 Peter 4.14. Peter amplifying says, If you are reproached, for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Not everyone will be reproached, or believers will be reproached to different degrees. If is conditional. It's the basis of something that is yet to be seen. Reproached is the Greek word, on a did so, and it's a strong word. It means to be reviled, to be denounced, to have insults heaped upon you, or to be assailed with abusive words. It is the word that was used for the things that were said by the thieves, by the scribes, and the chief priests to Christ as he hung on the cross, suffering for them. All of the blasphemies, all of the insults that they cast at Christ, these were reproaches. And Peter's reminding us here that it is not simply the word Christ that's involved here. Although I do believe, as does my wife very strongly, that when people use the word Christ or the name Jesus or the name God for that matter in a facetious way or a pointless manner, that that's to our detriment. And it's certainly to his detriment. Christ is the title It is the term Messiah. It is that unique term used specifically to point out the one that God has sent into the world to be the Savior of the world. But it's more specific than that. Christ, in this context, the name of Christ, is directly associated with the work of Christ and with believers as Christians. It is not the word that invokes such hatred. People use those words constantly, thoughtlessly, irreverently. What invokes the hatred is the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is uniquely identified. He is the only Christ, the one and only. And that is where the opposition becomes so intense. He is the incarnate, the living word. So in that context, Peter points out that their reproaches of Christ amount to nothing less than blasphemy. Blasphemy. And that's why, in a sense, our teeth should be put on edge when we hear those words used irreverently. And because they are directed at us, or as they are directed at us, for his name's sake, he is in that moment being glorified in us. Therein is the relationship. 
And if this should be our faith, to be reviled, to be cursed, to be criticized for living the Christian life, we are to count ourselves as blessed, highly favored of God, that he has deemed us fit to bear that burden. And Peter adds that while men heap insults on us, the spirit and glory of God rests upon us. Herein, the Holy Spirit is our enabler. We don't like, and I'm thinking back to childhood, how many of you can identify with this? Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words cannot hurt me. That's a lie. How many of you? You've been hurt. Maybe not just as children, but as adults. The things that people have said about you critically to hurt you, to deliberately to hurt you. That was no mistake. When we are reviled because we proclaim Christ as our Savior, we are glorified in that moment. The Holy Spirit enables us to endure it. And in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, that's not bad company to be with, is it? like the prophets who were before you. But there is a great distinction made here in Peter between suffering for Christ, for the cause of Christ, for living for Christ, and suffering because we've done something that is unworthy of Christ. They're two very different things. And that brings us to 1 Peter 4, 15 through 18. Peter offers a final thought. It's very complex, and it all ties together, so bear with me if you will. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? First and foremost, I want to point out that the phrase, let none of you suffer as a Christian, is a command. It's to be obeyed without exception. We are to be as concerned for that as the command, you shall not commit murder. It is indefensible, and <clears throat> Peter cites two very specific sins. It's indefensible to commit murder or to steal. These are, in all of the Judeo-Christian ethic, condemned as unthinkable. The third transgression shifts slightly, but is equally reprehensible, evil doing broad word. This is an umbrella word. And it's the word kakapoios, to do anything that is pernicious, anything that is harmful, anything that is evil to any degree. Now, it's used four times by Peter. This is a, a word that's significant for Peter. And it's only found one other time in the New Testament. And it's found in John chapter 18, verses 29 through 30. And that, to me, as I read that and look at them together, I see a certain significance. Pilate then went out to them, that's to the Jews, and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? We're now there at the trial of Christ. Why would you condemn him? What is it that he has done? What evil is it that he has done? They answered and said, If he were not an evil doer, 
a worker of evil, we would not have delivered him unto you. Now, first of all, that's an evasion. He said, what evil? Name it. They said, well, if he wasn't evil, we wouldn't have brought him. That's not an answer. There, were no, there was nothing they could actually, honestly, sincerely, rightly charge him with. And I find a significance here in the fact that Peter commands us to not be guilty of the very things for which our Lord Jesus Christ was falsely accused, condemned, and crucified. Whether or not that's Peter's in intent, I find it an insult to Christ to be called on one hand by his name and yet be guilty of the very things that he was falsely accused of doing as an excuse for crucifying. It's as if we are adding shame to the shame of the cross. The fourth sin that's listed by Peter is perhaps the most interesting, if not the most intriguing of all. To be a busybody in other people's matters. Now, I've told you over the past 15 years, the Greeks like to build words. They start with a core word, and they add something to it, and then something more, and something more. So the longer the word is, the more the Greek is trying to include in that word. This word is the is allotria pescopos, and that is, in fact, a mouthful in English or Greek. It's the only place that you find it in the Bible. And when literally translated, it means one who meddles in things alien to his calling. Now, the word calling is used because of the word episkopos, which would be overseer. So in the strictest sense, this is to interfere with another person's duties or responsibilities. In essence, if it's not your job, don't do it. It's an overstepping of one's bound. It's acting without authority. It's a very complicated word. You can look back to uh, a number of the examples that Peter has given of uh, being good citizens and uh, in submission to the civil authority, to, for servants to be in submission to their masters, for uh, wives to be in submission to their husband. In a general sense, it means to be a meddler, an agitator. And it is used to describe one who sticks his nose in someone else's business, especially uninvited. Now, Peter ties this to another phrase. Do not be these things. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, if you suffer for your faith, if you suffer for testifying of Christ, if you suffer for living for Christ, do not be ashamed, but glorify God in this matter. Understand the significance. Thank you, God, that I can suffer for this. That's not typical. That's not typical. The Christian should not suffer as a criminal. He should not suffer as an evildoer. But in point of fact, when we suffer for Christ and for our faith, we have no reason to be ashamed or feel disgraced because it's an honor to be persecuted for Christ. Think about it. How many believers, having shared Christ, maybe for the first time, and usually with a certain amount of fear or trepidation, or having stood up for some biblical principle in a, an unfriendly audience, have been ridiculed, have been reviled, and from that point on, they never say a word. They are frightened by the thought of suffering. We are to embrace it. Embrace it. The more they say against you, the more effective what you have said has been. Understand that. 
we have to ask ourselves, are we suffering because of a personal sin on our part, or are we suffering for our faithfulness for Christ? It is one thing to suffer for quote-unquote witnessing for Christ when you're being rude and abusive and insulting. That should never happen to begin with. It's another thing for kindly and lovingly and graciously sharing Christ and suffering. Many times we want to take credit for something that honestly we shouldn't have done to begin with or we've done badly. And I say this because of the words of verses 17 and 18. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then a following thought that amplifies it. Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, we might say, by the skin of his teeth, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? The time has come. He's calling his audience's attention to their present moment, their present circumstance. He doesn't say the time is far off. He doesn't even say the time is at hand or imminent. He said the time is here. It has now come. And the word time here is kairos. That's not time the way we mark it on a watch. We're not talking about seconds and minutes and hours. What we're talking about is a season that has certain characteristics, particularly a time of suffering. In this case, it's a season that is marked by judgment, assessment, evaluation. The time has come. It's a time of judgment. The judgment begins where? At the house of God. Now, some have interpreted this as applying to Israel in the context of Titus destroying Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70 with the argument that the temple is the house of God. And that's very convenient in light of the timing, but it's really addressed to the church. It's not addressed to Israel. Peter writes here, if it begins with us first. If this judgment begins with us first. I'd like to suggest it's not about the Bema Seat, where we're judged for rewards. It's not about the great white throne judgment where the lost are judged for their sins. Peter is speaking of the ongoing judgment or discipline of the believers of which we partake on a daily basis. It's not about judging our souls for heaven or hell. It's not even about judging our works for rewards. This is God bringing us back to him when we stray. How many of you would admit to sinning this past week? Most of you are being honest. My brother-in-law didn't sin for, what was it, three years? Of course, that's, he conveniently redefined what sin was. So, But keep this thought in mind. As believers, we sin. When we sin, we bring reproach to Christ. We give the world an excuse. God is not going to let us continue to sin. Not even in this world. You can really see this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. He begins speaking of Christ. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls with the hostility against you. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. 
For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all believers have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you don't endure chastening in your life as a Christian, when you stray away from God and sin, you ain't his. That's what Peter's saying, or rather Paul. You ain't his. I know, you ain't. Isn't that terrible? That's worse than yuns and y'all. You're illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who correct this. We understand this. We paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. Paul writes of believers who are chastened in this life for sins as a Christian. And you notice what he says. You have not resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. You've not fought the good fight. You haven't finished the race. You quit early. This is what he's saying. The pressure is building. He's told us about that. The suffering is here. He's told us about that. But don't quit short of victory. This word chastisement is the word paideia. It's primarily used for the chastening of children. Punishment for the purpose of improved behavior. Now, for the parents here, there's a contrast. There is punishment for the purpose of not being bothered as a parent, which is selfish. And there is punishment that is designed to help that child to be a better person. We need to be careful which side of that word we're on. The purpose of chastisement is not to destroy. It is to correct. God chastens his children when they sin, beginning with that unsettled feeling that you have because the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart. You've done something wrong. You can't put your finger on it. It then progresses, if we ignore that, to the Word, where it may be spoken by another believer or perhaps uh, the pastor in the pulpit, the Sunday school teacher, and it hits home and you walk out angry because you're telling the preacher, you preached that just because of me. No, I didn't. I was picking on everybody. He chastens his children. If we ignore every effort that he has to gently bring us back, then he begins to touch our lives. You go back to the study of Job, and you see all of the things that Job endured. Many of those things could actually come into our lives because God is more interested in us being right with him than he's interested in us being comfortable. He chastises us to bring us back. But because we are his children, God's purpose is always to bring us back into fellowship. He never changes us to hurt us. It's always to bring us back into fellowship. Verse 11 states, It, the chastening, yields, produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When we heed the chastening, it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. But if God's plan for his errant children is chastisement, 
What is to be expected by those who have rejected the gospel completely? Who have rejected Christ entirely? What do they have to look forward to? 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, to tie it together. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. That's us. If it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? If the righteous one is saved by the skin of his teeth, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? God will not tolerate our sins. We're his children. What is awaiting the children of the devil? Worth noting, he describes us as scarcely saved. Scarcely saved. Remember, we're saved by grace through faith. It's unwarranted, unearned, undeserved. It is a gift from God, and we need to continue to see it as such. We don't deserve salvation. Note also that the fate of the ungodly and the sinner who have rejected Christ is nothing less than what they have always wanted to be separated from God. All through life, the gospel has been offered. All through life, they've turned a deaf ear. They've turned a blind eye. They've rejected Christ and his grace. And so they will receive the very thing that they have sought all their lives. The Bible says that we will appear at the bema seat of Christ. Therein our works will be tested and tried, gold, silver, precious stones, etc. Our rewards will be determined. Those come into play during the millennium. The lost will appear at the great white throne judgment. They don't appear at the bema seat. They have nothing to be rewarded. They will be condemned. They're going to be cast out of God's presence for all eternity into hell, Gehenna, which is the place of fire. And it's in light of that final judgment that Peter offers us this final admonition in 1 Peter 4.19. Therefore, in light of eternity, in light of what is to come, let those who suffer according to the will of God Commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. If we've trusted Christ with our eternal souls, we can certainly trust him with what remains of our lives here in this world, now and until the day that he takes us home. We can trust him in the face of suffering. We can trust him in the face of persecution. We simply need to commit, completely turn over our souls to him in doing good because he is our faithful creator. So if we should suffer for Christ in the time that remains, let it be to bring glory to him now and for eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the strength and the help that it brings to us. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to apply these principles that you have shown us through Peter to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.